Yeah, so good afternoon everyone. I hope that you're still awake. Friday afternoon at 4, it's not always the best time, but anyway, um, I try to keep it a bit light. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a biophoretician, and indeed we're, we're part of this whole uh, conspiracy, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, and I've tried to, uh, you know, put together a couple of example projects and, and applications uh, that we run into. Um, but in the end of the day, maybe it's, it's good to start with the very basics of what, what are we dealing with. And I think for a lot of you guys, this is, uh, should be at least high school stuff. Yeah? And that is uh, this guy over here, it's the, it's the cell. Yeah? And in, inside the cell is a tiny little nucleus. Uh, and inside this nucleus is about two meters of DNA. Yeah? So in every cell is two, about two meters of DNA. It's tightly packaged, otherwise it doesn't fit, of course. Yeah, and certain parts of this DNA are uh, called uh, genes, and these genes are transcribed into RNA. And this is a process called gene expression. Is this ringing bells, by the way, for some of you guys? Yeah, this is biology, right? Um, and then these, uh, uh, these RNA molecules are actually messengers, uh, and they're translated into proteins. Yeah? And these proteins, they are the workhorses <laughs> of the cell, right? So, the cell consists of proteins, and the proteins do carry out all kinds of functions in this, uh, in this cell. Uh, and this is the system that we're dealing with. Yeah? So we try to, to measure, model, analyze data on this system to better understand it, to understand why it goes wrong sometimes, why sometimes cells start dividing uncontrollably. Yeah? Um, and we do that with uh, these kinds of machines. Yeah, so I, I, I recently had the pleasure of, of, of teaching a, a couple of the more uh, students from the molecular sciences and they just had a, had a lab tour and I'm always very excited if I enter the lab because there's these fancy machines and they cost uh, millions of euros and they produce massive amounts of data so they're really at the basis for a bioinformatician uh, and then I asked them, so yeah, how was it, right, the lab tour? And, oh, yeah, you know, a bunch of boxes you know, and they produce data, but they all look the same to us. And it's true, right, because these, these machines have really revolu revolutionized, and now, you know, they, they basically, uh, oh yeah, this doesn't work, they pretty much all look like this, it has a screen, you know, in goes the sample, out comes shitloads of data. Yeah? Um, but, uh, well, these are some of the more old-fashioned machines, and they also generate uh, lots of data. So let's focus a little bit on, on this machine, it's, it's really the workhorse of, uh, of molecular biology, it's called the next generation uh, sequencing machine. And you have to imagine that uh, the first time a human genome was sequenced, uh, yeah, yeah, a couple decades ago, um, and this costed about uh, two billion dollars. And it was an effort that was shared between many labs across the world. Yeah? And it took, I think, um, more than a decade to complete. Yeah? Nowadays with this machine, uh, we can get 30x coverage, that meaning that every single part of the genome is covered at least 30 times in about 24 hours for less than $1,000 and it produces about 90 gigs of data. Yeah, so this is quite a feat. Yeah? It was actually yeah, on Black Friday, there was even uh, a deal where you could get your personal genome sequenced for a couple hundred euros. Yeah? I don't know exactly how to do it. They might make some money off your data. Yeah. 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 But okay, you could do it. Yeah. Um, but why is this machine so popular? Of course, because of this. But also because this machine can be used to measure all kinds of other aspects of this uh, uh, molecular machine. Yeah. We can use it to measure gene expression, because we can transform these RNA molecules back to DNA, and then we can measure them and just count them. We can measure when proteins bind to the D DNA. Well, it is a process called cross-linking, so we cross-link them, we cut the DNA, and then we sequence the pieces that are bound by this protein, then we know where this protein bound in the genome. So there's all kinds of derivative measurements that we can achieve with this particular machine. So it's really a workhorse. It's generating a lot of data and a lot is creating a lot of insight. That's not it. So this is next generation. This is next next generation sequencing. It's a nanopore sequencer, and I actually brought one. It's a, it's, a, it's a pocket sized device. It's really, you, you connect it through USB with, uh, on your computer. Yeah. It's, a, it's marketed by uh, 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 ONT, Oxford Nanopore Technologies. 
this is a dummy flow cell, but this is basically where they make the money. It's the same for the razor blade model, right? So they, <laughs> they make money by selling these guys. This is pretty much free. Yeah, it costs a thousand bucks or something, and then you get one of these for free, so it's you know pretty much free. Yeah? But th this works completely differently from the other machine. So um, so here, this is a dummy one, but, but this is a real one. Here there's a membrane, and the membrane consists of protein nanopores. And you pipette your DNA sample in there, you need to prepare it in a certain way. And then the, the DNA is really pulled through the pore. And then uh, uh, the, the voltage across the pore, the current through the pore is measured. And then you get a signal like this. Yeah? And then you could start the detect, <coughs> you know, if you, what kind of washing machine you have from this signal. Yeah? <laughs> but for us it's it more interesting to actually uh, determine the base sequence. Yeah? So at every any given time, there's about five of the bases of the genome inside the pore, and these five bases they make a certain uh, signal. So we need to somehow work uh, our way back to what was the uh, uh, the original signal that or the DNA sequence that went through the through the pore. Yeah? And surprise, surprise, uh, they used hidden Markov models in in the in the beginning a couple of years ago, and and I think last year or so. They switched to a, a, a deep learning model, uh, which actually really also improved the quality of this uh, sequencing machine. So they also now rely on these, uh, these machine learning uh, algorithms. And um, um, so this machine now, it has a bigger brother as well, which is kind of a desktop size uh, machine, which, which slots four of these flow cells. And under the hood of this machine is also a couple of GPUs to actually do all the, all the deep learning. <laughs> Yeah, so this is really a game changer, right, in, in sequencing, because it's real time, so as soon as the thing flows through the pore, you can get the data, you can transform it to a sequence, you can do, start doing calculations. Zero capital investment, it generates, oh, that's another very important part, it generates really long reads. Yeah? The Illumina machines, it's about 150 base pairs long, so you need to chop up your genome into small 150 base pair sequences. Here, this can e be longer than one megabases. Yeah, so it's really long stretches of DNA that you can sequence at the same time. And, and there's even, this one has a bigger brother, and that brother even has a bigger brother. It's, it's <laughs> like this size, and that's used for in sequencing centers, so it can generate a lot, a lot of data as well. I'll, I'll, I'll probably, if I have time, I'll get back to one project that we're uh, running on this uh, particular machine. Yeah, so but I guess it's safe to say, and I hope you agree with me, that uh, nowadays, also in biology, we've entered the field of big data. Uh, they typically uh, uh, um, show that this uh, slide, I don't know how many of you know this, but this is time, and this is the cost per genome, uh, and then the green line is, you see, this is exponential scale by the way, and this is uh, the cost per genome dropping, yeah? and you see introduction of next-gen sequencing, it really uh, uh, drops dramatically. This is Moore's law, the white line. Yeah? So that means that there is this gap that starts to appear here. So it turns out that there is more data generated, or more rapidly, than the computers become faster. Yeah? And we somehow need to close this gap, right? Um, I like to think that that bioinformatics is the answer to that. But yeah, that's, uh, that's me, of course. Um, so this deals with the volume of the data, right? So there's a lot of data, and big data, when you talk about big data, typically people associate that to a lot of data. But in biology and, and for bioinformatics, you know, I always like to go down the list of the five V's of big data that is now typically used to describe big data. And in particular, this third V, the variety, for us is very important. And because what I said before is so we can use the sequencing data and other types of measurement devices to measure all kinds of different aspects of the cell. Yeah? We can measure the folding of the, of the DNA inside the cell nucleus. We can measure the activity of all the genes. We can measure the abundance of all the proteins, the shape of the proteins, how they interact with each other. Yeah? So we can measure all these kinds of things. And oftentimes, it's not so much the volume, because you know, compared to maybe what you guys do, uh, what Google and Facebook do, you know, volume is, is not really an issue. It's more the integration. Yeah, the complexity of, of how to integrate these data, uh, how to combine them, these multi-modalities right, of, of the same uh, object. And so I think a lot of uh, uh, what, uh, what we do also deals with this uh, variety aspect. And so in a nutshell, kind of bioinformatics, how I typically describe it, is kind of a marriage between three dis different disciplines. On the one hand, statistics, on the one hand, computational sciences, and it's always, of course, inspired by 
the biology, and then you, you have these different flavors and in the middle, so it's uh, bioinformatics. Yeah. Alright, so let's, uh, let's go into a couple of uh, examples. The first one is prognostic classification. It's an interesting example because I think it's also one of the first examples where uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, uh, was used in, in uh, molecular medicine. And it deals uh, with this particular problem. Um, um, so the, the first classifier, I think at least, uh, um, dealt with breast cancer, which is not so surprising because it's the most prevalent cancer in the Netherlands and uh, worldwide. And in about 80% of the treatments, adjuvant chemotherapy is given. So there's some treatment in which you also get chemotherapy. Now from clinical trials, actually if you look closely at the efficacy of this chemotherapy, you know, about only 40% of the women actually experience a relapse, uh, even without the chemotherapy. So that means that there, there is a lot of over-treatment going on. There's a lot of women that receive chemotherapy that might actually not even experience a relapse and therefore do not really benefit from the chemo. At the flip side, they suffer a lot from the adverse side effects, of course, of this chemotherapy. Yeah? Now, the idea uh, um, uh, that uh, was explored in, in the early 2000s by a lot of labs, uh, including also the Netherlands Cancer Institute, uh, uh, Laura van Veer uh, was spearheading this together with René Bernhardt, uh, was can we not use machine learning classifiers to somehow make this distinction between women that would or would not experience a relapse? Yeah? So what they did is they, they created a cohort of patients with a, which they followed and they put a threshold at five years where the women would be uh, uh, relapse free, yes or no, after five years. And then they, they uh, uh, took biopsies yeah, and they did migraze. Migraze is, is just a, it's a chip basically and it allows you to measure the activity of all the genes in the sample in one go. So you have, it's called the gene expression. Yeah. Uh, so you have basically features, so, so we have about 20, 25,000 genes, so it's a, it's a high dimensional space and uh, relatively few patient samples here. Uh, I think the first classifiers were based on a couple hundred patients, so it's a uh, small and large B uh, problem. Yeah, and, and then the idea was to make this classifier, and they were successful. Yeah, Lava Van Veer in 2002 published in Nature this paper where they had a classifier that could uh, 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 show this uh, uh, fact. Um, I don't know, this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve, it's, it's in biology the typical way of, of uh, revealing classifier performance. So this is the, the time, yeah, and this is the percentage uh, um, that's still alive, and then you see that there's a really big difference between the, two, between the two groups, right? And you can do some statistics on the difference, uh, the, so the difference by and large is called the hazard ratio, and you can do some statistics, and this is a very significant uh, hazard ratio. Yeah, so they were really happy. And, um, um, just to give you an example, this is not just an academic exercise, they actually spun this out into a company called Agenda, maybe you've heard of it, it was in the news uh, uh, two, two, three months ago, uh, because they, they marketing now the MAMA print, which is, uh, so this classifier was based on 70 genes, so, so the, it selected 70 genes, 70 breast cancer genes, and this is now used in the US, in the Netherlands, and uh, a couple months ago they found out that in the Netherlands, there's a lot of debate nowadays whether it will be reimbursed by the insurance agent. Now, um, I'll not go into that, uh, that um, uh, into there, but uh, I just want to put forward here that you know machine learning is really uh, making a difference here in the, in the uh, clinical setting. And the reason that this is still there is that two years ago they really did uh, phase three clinical trials where they did a randomized trial, and it actually it works. Not enormous effects, but a significant effect. Uh, and this is not the only one, there exists now numerous ones. Another one that I'll mention is uh, from Skyline Diagnostics, it's a Rotterdam-based company, spun out of the arresters, uh, and they are marketing a very similar product, which is the MN Profiler for multiple myeloma. Yeah, so, so um, something that, that we do in, in the lab is to say, okay, so we can apparently, we can do this, well, we can make this classifier for uh, uh, this, this uh, relapse, yes or no, or whether the, the treatment works, yes or no. Uh, but wouldn't it be interesting if we take this classifier that apparently works, open it up, and look to see what's inside. Why does it work? And if we understand why it works, maybe we learn something new about the underlying biology. 
Yeah? That's the, the general idea. So it's called interpretability. Yeah? So can we, by interpreting the model, learn something about also the, the biology? No, this turned out to be uh, quite difficult, and this was already kind of shown in 2005. Um, there's a, a, a group, uh, led by Andor et al., that um, uh, did the following experiment. So they kind of recapitulated the classifier that Van Veer uh, made, so that, that's this one. It's based on 70 genes. Yeah, so, and one way to interpret is to just say, okay, these 70 genes, what are they? Are they cancer genes? You know, do we understand which genes they are, how they connect to each other? Uh, and can we learn something from them? So they said, well, let's, let's delete these 70 genes from the data and retrain a classifier. This is what they found. Yeah. Pretty much the same thing. So they said, ah, oh, maybe we were lucky. Maybe it was 140 genes. Let's delete them and continue. This is what they found. Well, you can see. They could keep doing that without a lot of uh, difference, right? So, for interpretation of the classifier, if you want to look into what these 70 genes mean, this is of course bad news. Because apparently there exist a lot, a lot of ways in which you can take 70 genes from the 24,000 genes that you started with uh, to make a classifier that actually works. Yeah, so, so, if we want to do interpretation, we probably need to do a bit more work. And one of the very common approaches, and something that we also uh, followed, is to do a data integration, uh, follow a data integration strategy. And it's based on the uh, uh, idea that you know, genes they do not act in isolation. Genes are what we call in biology uh, part of pathways. So in some genes, they activate the activity of other genes or they repress them. Proteins can bind to each other to form complexes, doing certain functions together. Yeah? And these these, these maps, these wiring diagrams, there is databases uh, about these, these, these wiring diagrams. Right? So we can, we can basically download them. And then maybe the idea is, can we not inform the classifier somehow of, you know, at least what we know of biology in terms of this wiring diagram. And that's called network-based outcome prediction. And if you look at all the methods that have been published, and that's what uh, Amin uh, Alloy, I did, a um, uh, PT student uh, in my uh, group. Basically, they all follow the same recipe. And that's to say, they, they took a network from one of the databases. So these are a couple of names you will probably not recognize them, but they are. They contain these wiring diagrams that I talked about. So they say, okay, now let's take a, a, a subpart of this network, a subnetwork, yeah? because apparently these genes that are in the subnetwork they have something to do with each other, right? They, they regulate each other, they interact with each other, something. Right? So let's take the expression and somehow integrate this gene expression into what they call a metagene. Yeah? And all the methods actually use the, an average operation to integrate the gene expression. We actually showed in this paper that that's not so smart to do. So we've tried a couple of other ways of integrating them. Actually, we tried many different ways and combine all those. But then once we have these metagenes, you can rank them and then just do the prediction. So there's a couple of basic steps that basically all these methods follow. A selection, an integration, a ranking, and then a classification. Yeah. And uh, uh, to, to solve this all in one go, we opted for uh, a sparse group lesson. Probably you, some of you know this. It's a, it's a linear model that's he heavily regularized for the groups and for the features that you select within the groups. So what we basically did is, is, is we tried all possible subnetworks, so we kind of expanded the feature space even further, all kinds of integrations, and then used use this very heavily regularized model to select what is important yeah, in one go, yeah, and build a classifier at the same time. This is what we did, and it turns out uh, to work quite well. So in the red, that's our method. Uh, these are the existing methods, and these are the methods that we already improved by just plugging in a simple uh, group lasso. And you see that, that we work uh, a little bit better. This is done on the ACEs, it's a compendium uh, uh, of breast cancer uh, uh, patients, about 1,600 uh, patients, the gene expression of those. But, you know, what's more, in this is AUC, so that's uh, how well does the classifier work. But for us, what's more interesting is, can we now start doing this interpretation? Yeah? And we did this, but, and I will not go into a lot of detail, except for mentioning that if we just look at the stability, yeah, so which was so important, of these, these genes that we find, with our method, yeah, we find way more stable signatures, which is really important if you want to do uh, interpretation. What we also did is, okay, can we define, predefine certain groups of genes 
uh, that we think might be interesting. Yeah? So there actually exist databases that do this. The gene ontology is one of them. So we did, we, we collected some of these groups and then we asked, so how frequently do we find genes in one of these groups now? And we compare that with the other methods. And then you see that with our method, we find way, way more enrichment. It's called enrichment. Way more enrichment for these expected categories. Also an indication that um, um, and the, the, the stuff that we find with our method really is amenable to interpretation. Yeah? And that's what we did. We then started building networks of these, uh, of these genes and, and looked to see if it made any biological sense. And then uh, also talked to biologists and, and cancer biologists to, to see if they are and maybe uh, can form new hypotheses about how uh, uh, the underlying etiology of this particular disease, uh, if that, that, that would help them in, in, in any way. Oh yeah, this, I actually added the slide. So, so this is one of these networks that we then uh, can, uh, can derive. Uh, so we also tried many different uh, types of data sources uh, of, of uh, protein interactions and stuff like that. And then this is uh, in the end what we uh, came up with. And you know, you see these enrichments for tamoxifen resistance. So tamoxifen is one of the uh, most important uh, chemotherapeutics uh, and, and the histological grade of invasive breast cancer. So you see these enrichments that kind of from a biological point of view, kind of uh, kind of makes sense. So that's 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 good. So what type of networks are those? I mean, yeah. So so, it, so here for this one, we actually uh, turn the problem around and actually start inferring the network oh, ourselves. Yeah, so we have yeah. a, on one fold of the data we infer a network, then we build a classifier, and then we validate the classifier on three different uh, folds, oh, and we can rotate that. Yeah. Um, and in this, we actually used uh, a protein-protein interaction network. So that's a uh, experimentally derived network where they measured which proteins bind to which other proteins. Yeah. Yeah, so and is, that, is that scale free or is that you know? Typically these networks are, are scale free. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah that's right. Um, Alright, so now I want to uh, uh, switch a, a little bit to what we call predictive classification. So first we, we try to uh, uh, predict prognosis, right? But maybe we are more interested in predicting which treatment should we give to which patient. Yeah? We know that the patient population is very heterogeneous, and we know that certain patients respond very well to a treatment, whereas other patients do not respond very well. But, you know, if we, so just like before, you know, we, we want to know for sure that the patient that we give, a, uh, the treatment that we give a patient is working, because a lot of these treatments have very serious side effects. Uh, so, so the question is, can we not come up with a machine learning model that predicts if for that particular patient, for instance, based on the gene expression profile, so that's the activity of all these 24,000 genes, that predicts whether or not the treatment will work. Now there's, there's one issue that we have here, if, if you look at the, the labels. Yeah? So if we have a patient that survived for a very long time, it's impossible to know if that patient would have survived even longer on a different treatment. Yeah. Or conversely, if a patient did not survive very long, well maybe <coughs> on a different treatment, he or she would have survived even shorter, right? We simply don't know. Yeah. So what we would like to know is actually, if we have a patient, yeah, and we give it a certain treatment, and then in some kind of, you know, maybe a parallel universe or something like that, <laughs> we have the same patient, and we give it the other treatment. Yeah, and then see who survives. Yeah. That's what we would like. And but this, of course, at least so as far as I know, I know last time I checked, there's no parallel universe. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did is, yeah, so maybe complexity, I don't know, maybe you guys found something that I didn't <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so, so well, this key idea actually we carried forward, but then in a, in a, in a kind of a new uh, uh, machine learning framework, which we called uh, simulated treatment learning, which kind of simulates treating the same patient twice. And it does that by comparing patients that are just genetically similar. So what we do is we take a patient and we look at genetically similar neighbors, and then we say, okay, we want to know how that, that received the opposite treatment. So the neighbors that received the opposite treatment. And then if, if this patient survives much better than its genetically similar neighbors, then at least we have some indication that this patient received the right treatment. And we can use those, we call them prototype patients, to classify other patients. Yeah, so in a, in a nutshell, if you have your gene expression day, uh, 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 your patient in gene expression space, this is two genes, remember it's high dimensional in, in reality. The two classes, this is a treatment for tezomib, it's a MM, I'll get to that in a second. So the two treatments, blue and the, the yellow treatment, they're fully overlapping, 
which is always the case for uh, uh, a randomized clinical trial. Yeah. But what we want to know is, okay, so suppose I take a bortezomib patient, and then I look at its genetically similar uh, patients, so that's patients that are close in gene expression space, and then I, I calculated the difference in survival, and I compare that uh, to what would happen with random patients, to, to take into account you know, the overall uh, effect, and then I calculate some kind of z-score based on this, I do that a lot of time, these random papers. So I have a z-score, and then I find patients that really survive longer than I would expect based on these random neighbors. And then I take a new fold in my data, so an independent data set, I, I, I copy over these, these two prototypes, and then I start looking in the neighborhood of these patients, do I find now also uh, a patient that survive uh, longer? So I need to optimize some kind of, you know, how far from this prototype should I be? So the classifier is actually quite simple, is first of all, how many prototypes should I use? And the second one is, okay, how far can I be from one of these prototypes? Now, the algorithm is a little bit more complex because this is for two genes. So we actually do something similar to a random forest where we take a lot of subsets of, of, of features uh, and then we combine them in some kind of ensemble way. We have a kind of a nested cross-validation to take care of, of, of uh, leakage. I will not explain that here. Um, but explain only the results, so we, we focused on uh, multiple myeloma, which is a malignant proliferation of plasma cells, so in the blood lineage you have certain cells that are uh, plasma cells, and, and uh, this particular cancer has a, a, a pretty poor survival between five and six years, so it's, there's not so many good treatments uh, for this uh, particular cancer, and in, in part it is because uh, it's characterized by a very large genetic heterogeneity, yeah, so a lot of the patients have a different uh, uh, somatic genotype for any scan. Now, what we did is we, we uh, took uh, 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 clinical trial data for uh, a new drug called uh, bartezomib. Uh, so because this is uh, uh, such a bad cancer, uh, there's lots of new treatments being proposed, and one of them is bartezomib. And you know, this is the Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, for this treatment of the clinical trial. You can see that uh, you know, there's a little bit of benefit for bartezomib. And for the drug companies, you know, this is great news, yeah, because it shows it's significant, yeah, ta-da, it's significant, <laughs> yeah, and uh, now they can give this drug to basically all the patients, yeah, because it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, different. What we ask is, okay, is this now indeed true that it's a small benefit for all the patients, or is there maybe a subgroup that really benefits a lot, and another group where there's really no benefit, and then we might actually save these patients from taking this drug because bortezomib has, has serious side effects. Yeah, so then this is the situation, there's one group which is really big difference and another group where these lines are on top of each other. Now, when we apply this, this classifier that I explained, this is the result. Um, so the overall hazard ratio is 0.75, and low is good in this case. And in now we find a group, which we call the benefit group, where the hazard ratio is much lower, 0.5, which is also very significant. Uh, so that means that we really found a group that, that would have uh, uh, survived better on, on uh, bortezomib. Yeah? So this can now really uh, um, you know, predict for a new patient whether or not you should uh, give bortezomib. Now, this is just one uh, particular uh, uh, drug. So what we did is there's another data set uh, for a different drug, lenalidomide. So it's, it's a, a different data set with 662 patients. It's also a di different measurement technology. So, so we didn't apply the same classifier, but we retrained, uh, retrained this classifier in, a, again, a cross-validated uh, fashion. And we actually also find such a group. Yeah? So in a completely independent data set, we can now find a group that truly benefits from um, uh, Lena Do the groups overlap? Can you tell? In, in terms of patients? Yeah, I mean, is the, the guy switch take the one drug and survive better, do, which benefit more from bortezomib <coughs> and it's called, do they oh. also benefit better from this one? Yeah, so, so but they're completely different patients oh, that okay. are in both uh, data Because this would be really interesting, right? Because yeah. maybe there's a group which benefits from, from sort of yeah. any drug and there's yeah. a group yeah. where no, no drug at all will yeah. save them. So. Yeah, yeah but, so, but the, the, again, we run into the problem that we can only treat the patient <laughs> once. Right, yeah. right. okay, I yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You, could, you could look on the classifier and see if the if if similar predict, genes yes. Yeah. Uh, in, are in both classifiers or not? No, no, that's true. And, and, and what we, I think, also didn't do is really just apply the one, the classifier that we had in Bortezomib yeah. to the lenalidomide. Yeah. So we could do that. I don't think that we did that. No. Um, the problem is that this is RNA sequencing and the other one is microarray technical detail, but 
Okay, that's that's uh, yeah. So we actually we so this is MM, uh, where data set sizes are relatively small. And we have we're now doing a project on breast cancer, and breast cancer because it's so prevalent, it's a it, there's much more samples, much more data available, and um, um, we see uh, the same thing. Yeah, we can also make a classifier in this way for for breast cancer, which even actually works. Uh, better uh, than uh, this uh, um, uh, test that's now currently on the market. So mm -hmm. that's very promising. All right. Um, yeah. I was just wondering, did you get any feedback from the pharmaceutical companies? <laughs> because you're messing up their <laughs> money making. Uh... Yeah. Well, um, not directly, but uh, so <laughs> Joska, Joska Ubos, she's a PhD student in my group. And she's working for Skyline DX, that's the, the diagnostics company, and they are in touch with uh, a lot of these pharma companies. And, you know, of course they are not so happy if you, if you, you know, make the group of patients much smaller. But on the flip side, uh, this is something that, that we don't see so often, but, but uh, most of the clinical trials fail. Yeah? And now, even for such a failed trial, with this kind of technology, we can now start maybe identifying a subgroup that kind of would rescue their clinical trial, right? So, so we are talking, you know, and trying to give it a positive spin. Yeah, yeah but so I think that's really uh, um, a very interesting promise of this, right? Because a lot of money is lost on clinical trials that don't meet their endpoint. Um, yeah. So, so now I want to talk, talk a little bit more about this guy, which we also uh, use in practice, uh, and that deals with liquid biopsies. So. By and large, there's really two important challenges in cancer research. One is, you know, if you give a patient uh, a, a treatment, you know, to, to determine whether it works yes or not, does the tumor shrink, does it go away, when is the patient tumor free? And another uh, important uh, um, um, aspect is, is, you know, if, if a patient is declared tumor free, you know, for a lot of tumors, the tumor actually <coughs> still recurs, right? you get these relapses. And you want to detect these relapses as early as possible to restart the treatment or, or try different treatments. Yeah. Now, these are the two uh, uh, ways in which this is typically done. So radiologic imaging, either with the MRI or with the CT scanner, or needle biopsies. Yeah, so I know which one I would choose, but, but both are not so nice, actually. Right? This is very expensive and also very burdensome for the patient. This one you cannot do every day, for instance. This one you typically can also not do every day. Um, um, and the analysis workflow is also uh, quite high. Now there's this, this promise, which is called a liquid biopsy, where the idea is that we can take a vial of blood, yeah, and the idea is that tumors, you know, they, they, they grow, of course, but these tumor cells, they also die, just like every other cell in our body dies. And when these die, cells die, they need to be cleaned up, yeah, and in this process, the DNA that's inside these cells, they are shed into the bloodstream. Yeah. Now you have to imagine that um, for a <coughs> decent tumor, about uh, somewhere between 1 and, and maybe up to 10% of the DNA that, that's floating around in the bloodstream, that is called cell-free tumor DNA, uh, is, is indeed derived from the, from the tumor. Yeah. Now, but these, 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 we know cancer is caused by mutations, right? So the idea is that maybe if we look at this DNA, we can identify whether it came from the tumor or whether it came from a healthy cell. Yeah. And if we find tumor DNA, then maybe that's an indication that there are still tumor cells present somewhere. Yeah. Um, now, the problem is the genome is a big place. A typical tumor has maybe, what, a couple hundred uh, mutations. Uh, and the, the, tumor, uh, uh, sorry, the genome is uh, 3 billion base pairs long. So, if you look at, if you do the math, there's only very tiny fractions, so, so these, these, these molecules, these DNA molecules are, are small, about 150 base pairs, 180 sometimes. And so only a very tiny fraction of these molecules actually carries a mutation and can therefore be identified um, potentially. Yeah. So if you look at one vial of blood, there's really literally in, in the hundreds of molecules that carry one of these mutations. So if we want to detect them, we need an extremely sensitive detection method. Yeah? Extremely sensitive, because if we make a mistake, yeah? so if we read an A and it was in fact a C, we've already, you know, we kind of think that there is a mutation, but there is no mutation. Yeah? So we need to be extremely sensitive. And of course, preferably also cheap and fast and, you know, uh, a point of care. 
well, this machine potentially uh, promises to deliver point of care. Yeah, it's small, it's, it's indeed also cheap, and it's fast. Sensitivity is a bit of a problem. Yeah, this is relatively uh, recent introduction on the market. Uh, so the error rates in this machine are in the order of 10%. Well, if you see these numbers, 10% no. error, that's, that's not uh, going to cut it. So what we did is we came up with a strategy to still use these nanopore sequencers in order to reach sensitivity that would allow us to uh, measure in this uh, uh, range. And that's uh, called Cyclomics. It's a collaboration with uh, Richard Klosterman uh, and Alessio Marcozzi, the two colleagues of mine in, back in the UMC. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a kit that uh, prepares the DNA in a certain way, and I'll explain the, the basics in, in a second, that allows uh, uh, circulating cell-free tumor DNA to be sequenced on one of these uh, uh, portable devices, the nanopore devices. And it allows basically the, uh, uh, the decision whether the tumor is present or, or absent. Yeah, so we actually filed for a patent, and we started a company called Cyclomics, um, uh, to, to really see also if we can get this invention, really bring it to the patient. Yeah? And, and that's why uh, you need uh, to, 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 to start that business. So there's a valorization trajectory actually. Mm -hmm. Now, so how does it work? So you have these short DNA fragments, the CD DNA fragments. And what we did is we designed uh, a backbone, so that's just basically a piece of DNA, which can capture these small uh, uh, molecules into a circle. Yeah? And now we can use a, a standard molecular biology uh, trick and it's called rolling circle amplification. It's basically a polymerase that starts reading this circle and copying it many, many times. And then you get these molecules of backbone, insert, backbone, insert, backbone, insert. Yeah. Now these are really long molecules, but that's good because this guy can read in these really long DNA fragments. Yeah, so you get this, you get this signal. Yeah. And then, of course, the question is, okay, so which part is now... Uh, insert and which part is backbone. Yeah? And once we know this, we could potentially align all these inserts together and then the, presumably the errors, they're kind of random, but the, the mutation, an actual mutation, should occur in all these reads, right? Mm -hmm. And so we could kind of average out the error and get a very, very reliable indication of which base is a, is a mutation. This is kind of the, the basic concept. Now. How do we do this? Well, first of all, to, to find back these, these backbones and these inserts, we use dynamic time warping yeah, to, to kind of get a, a mapping of, of an expected signal, the backbone signal, to the, the signal that came out of the nanopore device. The nice thing is that we can use GPU acceleration to, uh, to, to get this. This is the, the traces, so these are the backbone matches. You see a very nice match, and then this segment in the middle is predicted to be the insert yeah, between two, two backbones. Yeah. Now, this works actually quite well, and then you get, you know, these, these uh, signals for these, for these inserts, and now the question is, can we spot in this data these mutations? Yeah, we, we have some, some basic algorithms to do this, which are based on, on the base calling, so we actually base call these data, and then we just look to see, you know, if, if it's an A, 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 uh, uh, where the reference base is a T, then we call it a mutation. But more recently, and, and that's a work in progress and I will not show any results, but we're using deep learning to actually uh, uh, take these signals and call the mutations much more uh, reliable, reliably. And so the first indication is that this uh, will really boost uh, up the sensitivity even, uh, even further. Now, does this work? Um, so what we did as, as a proof of concept, we actually uh, uh, took a patient that was imaged. This is head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer is a particularly interesting application domain because uh, it recurs in about 50% of the, of the patients and, and these recurrences they can often be detected only uh, after it's too late. And so the imaging, so there's, there's a potentially some tumor uh, uh, growth going on there and if you talk to the radiologist you know in all honesty he says it's often a coin flip whether the tumor is actually present yes or no and that has to do with the fact that these patients have received a quite a heavy operation so there's all kinds of scar tissue fibrotic tissue uh, and therefore it's very hard to image this particular region so in this particular head and neck cancers it's um, uh, very useful to, to do these kinds of liquid biopsies to detect the recurrence before it's too late so we took, we had a, a vial of blood of this patient in, in, the, in the freezer, actually, and we applied our cyclomics technology, and, and so these are all the reads that we uh, detected, and this is 
uh, a measure for the mutation evidence. And we actually indeed immediately spot uh, the P53, uh, that's what we focus on, it's a gene P53, which is mutated in 90% of the head and neck cancer patients. And we spot these P53 mutations uh, after you know, an hour of sequencing already. Yeah, indicating that, uh, and it turned out actually that this patient did have a recurrent tumor. So this for us was a proof of concept to, to show that it actually uh, works. And we're now uh, exploring uh, this uh, for, for more, more patients and working hard on also getting the deep learning uh, uh, going uh, to, to even uh, further improve our, uh, our detection of these mutations. So this has time permitting, and now I'm looking at the chair. Yeah, it's, good. it's Friday afternoon. Yeah, yeah? I still have to until five. Okay, I'll try to make it. Okay. Okay. So this is this will take five minutes. Yeah. So we talked already about mutations, these, these P53 mutations, and that were mostly single base pair uh, mutations. Yeah. But if you look at, at the fraction of the genome that's mutated by single base pairs, it's only 1.1% or some, something like that. What's actually more uh, co covering more of the genome are what we call structural variations. Yeah? And you have to imagine that structural variation, if this is the reference genome, so let's say a healthy kind of average genome, sometimes certain chunks are missing. Let's say a whole chunk B is, is missing. Or there's actually a new chunk inserted, or it's copied, it's a duplication. Or it's actually taken out and inverted and put back. Yeah? We call that structural variations. Yeah? And, and they, uh, they are very important for disease. And so there are several diseases that are linked to one of these structural variations, either in the germline, meaning that you are born with it, or somatically, and those are mostly cancers. So you, you acquire these somatic variations as a result of all kinds of cellular stress, smoking, etc. Et yeah? um, so, so to detect these, these, these uh, structural variants, in the genome is very important for studying disease, for diagnosis, etc. Now, how is this done? Using one of these next generation sequencing machines that I showed you. So, what the, they do is they chop up the genome into these small 150 base pair uh, sequences, and then you get all these sequence reads, and then if you know they map it to the reference genome. Now, if this piece is, is missing in the in the patient, then you see this drop. Yeah, there's no reads derived from this region. Yeah? So then you can clearly spot these, these deletions from the coverage yeah? or a duplication that would show as an as a increase in these regions. Now it becomes a bit more complex because they read actually from two sides, they call paired end sequencing, so you have two parts of the read actually, and also the order and the orientation of the, of the mappings yeah, that it determines whether we're looking for instance, the interchromosomal translocation, so one maps here and another to another chromosome, that means that one piece was moved to another chromosome. An inversion means that maybe you map something correctly here and then this one is inverted. So this signal of how these guys map, that's very important for determining whether there is structural variation occurring. Yeah? And there's all kinds of tools, these are just names that won't say anything to you, but there are many, many tools that have all kinds of rules of how to actually identify these structural variations. Now, if we look at these tools, they agree in only very small fractions. Yeah? So one predicts there's an SV here, another predicts there's an SV there, and the concordance is, is very poor. What's the uh, main problem is that all these, these methods are basically a, a bunch of rules that you need to tweak and tune manually. That's how, you know, historically these, these algorithms have, have, have uh, arisen, right? So, and, and there's a lot of manual tweaking. If you change the parameter here, you get some more false positives here, more false negatives there. So they're a nightmare to tune. So there's some, some efforts now that says, okay, well maybe we should just uh, uh, similar to an uh, ensemble... Uh, did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> similar to, to an ensemble classifier. Dames and heren, het pand gaat om vijf uur sluiten. Ik wens u een fijn weekend. Vijf uur? Vijf uur. Vijf uur. Vijf uur. Vijf The building will close at five o'clock. We wish you all a nice weekend. Five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm almost done. Anyway, so so what they're trying to do is to combine a lot of these colors in, a, in an ensemble kind of way. You have to imagine that these colors, they're extremely expensive to run, a little bit similar to what you showed. Mm -hmm. and so, so they take up a lot of resources. So we thought, isn't it a bit silly to just run all these algorithms that are suboptimal and then combine them, they cost a lot of money. So can we not do that a bit smarter? Uh, so this is the uh, typical picture what you get uh, from all your map reads. 
Uh, and this is a very clear, clear cut case where you see some, some drop in coverage. In reality, you know, it's, it's much less uh, uh, fuzzy. Yeah? But we thought, can we not train a deep learning model on, on these data? Yeah? And there have been some efforts that actually train deep learning on these screenshots. So this is IGV, it's an it's a integrative genome viewer, so it's really a visualization tool to, to, make these screen, uh, to make these visualizations. And we said, wow, that, that, that's a bit silly. So, so can we not do something a bit more smart? So what we did in the end of the day, so we took a window and we started to characterize all the, the reads mapped in the window. So we call that channel, so it, the coverage obviously is one, that's this track, so that's a very good one. But there's all kinds of other uh, tracks that you can imagine, so the number of clipped reads, so the, the, the reads that have a split, uh, the distance to the, to the, the other read, uh, and all kinds of aspects of the genome. Yeah? So we can now encode you know, how easy is it to map a read, so to, 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 to to, have, to piece one puzzle piece there in the genome. How bendable is the genome locally? We can have all kinds of features on the genome structure locally. And uh, uh, so we have, we extract all these channels from the tumor and the normal sample. We feed it into a convolutional neural network. And then we detect these breakpoints, which then uh, can be transformed into uh, structural variants. Now, this is again work in progress. Uh, uh, so what we did is, is, is two tests. First of all, a uh, uh, test on artificial data. So you can actually make a break and then simulate that reads are coming from this break. There's actually tools for this that, that simulate, given the error profiles of these sequencing machines, realistic error, uh, reads from these machines. So we, we did that and we took some real data where they used some orthogonal uh, um, a biological uh, uh, validation, so they can do PCR reactions for those of you that know, to really validate whether an SV is true, yes or no. Now, these are the results in, in precision and recall. So, for, for the artificial data, these are duplications, translocations, insertions, etc. So, you see that you know it's all pretty much above 95% uh, uh, of precision and the recall. And this is a, a test for real data. The numbers here in terms of the, da the data set sizes are much lower uh, because you know, it's expensive to validate, uh, to validate this. But we see that also there the, the precision and recall is, um, is quite high. So this is really encouraging for us. Uh, so we're now in the process of creating more training data. So that costs a bit of money. But then hopefully in the end of the day we have a reliable model, deep learning model, that can actually predict these structural variants very accurately and can also be used for instance, in the clinic uh, to do this uh, for regular diagnostics. So with that, I would like to thank uh, these people that are part of my group um, and uh, maybe thank you for your attention and thank you very much. Questions? It's really fascinating uh, applications, really nice. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, I um, You were mentioning earlier this. Um, uh, what was it? The Lama something testing kit. Yeah. No, 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 how far away, how far away is this from sort of being used day to day? In it is. Place? No, the, it is. It's just not it's reimbursed yet. Uh -huh. So the hospital. But I, I mean, for the, the um, all these um, technology and these approaches, like how. How long does it typically take from, from oh, right. like the research place yeah. to actually? Yeah. So so it can go quick, uh, and we with our company we also run into yeah. this, but it's relatively quick. So, so so to give you an example, so so our patent was filed in December last year. So it's December, so it takes one year. Yeah. So now we have priority, mm -hmm. and I think we can get something in the clinic already mid this year. Oh. Okay. But that's. That's a research-only device. Mm -hmm. yeah? Funnily enough, that, that, that's how it works. And it can only be used by academic hospitals uh, under academic supervision, but you can actually use it, but the doctor always makes the final decision. Yeah? So it's, a, it's called a research-only device. And a lot of these devices are pushed into the hospitals at the, in a research-only setting. Now, you want to, of course, get FDA approval or a CE marking. Then you know the trouble starts because that's those are lengthy processes that require indeed clinical trials, etc., etc. Yeah, but yeah, so so it can go quick for the first kind of patients to benefit from it. But if you really want to go full scale, you need one of these markings, and that that's what takes the money and the time. Yeah. 
So when you may, may, uh, detect these mutation patterns, huh? I guess, I mean, do you, you really know sp very specifically? You don't, you have to, I mean, it's not sufficient to detect, you know, type of mutation. You have yeah. to detect the pattern, I suppose. For the, for the... Because my people might have mutations which have nothing to do with yeah. it. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, so for the liquid biopsy approach, for the head and neck cancer, for instance, 90% uh, uh, of the patients carry a mutation in P53. Yeah. But typically what we can do is we can also just sequence these patients uh, the, 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 because they already have undergone an operation, so yeah, we have the exactly. tumor, so we can sequence the tumor. Yeah. Um, but um, what we are ultimately aiming for is, is to abolish that step and to just be able to you know, sequence the, uh, from the blood, uh, get a, a somewhat complete picture of the whole tumor. Uh, and then indeed it is again uh, uh, maybe a pattern recognition uh, 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 approach to kind of figure out if that's likely to occur by chance or whether it's uh, likely a re relapse of the tumor. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Yeah, I was yeah. curious about the acceptance of healthcare professionals for this kind of solutions. What what do they need if you if they are yeah. Yeah, so, so we, we, this project uh, is, is in collaboration with the pathology department uh, where they are already heavily investing in um, uh, liquid biopsies mm -hmm. using different technologies. Uh, and, and all these technologies that are in their hands now are, are suboptimal. It's very laborious, so for each patient you have to design new primers, and it's called a DDPCR, uh, if you're familiar with that. So it's, it's a very laborious uh, 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 process. And this would promise to have one test for every patient, mm -hmm. yeah. And and so they're very interested in this. Uh, Do you yeah. say that the uh, the doctor has the final decision? Uh, for a research only uh, uh, kit, yeah. yes, yeah, that's. Uh, and but I can imagine that not all doctors fully understand these techniques. Is that a problem for them, or are they? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not entirely sure what the rules and regulations are on this, but um, I can imagine that. Uh, if you use a research-only device, that, that it is assumed, or you yeah. should make sure that you also understand the device, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any final question? If not, then uh, thank you, Jeroen again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.